This work and others like it has been brought to you by Patreon. Shout out to my contributors, the names of which are on screen. Your gratuity is greatly appreciated. If you enjoy this content and would like to support me in my efforts, consider becoming a member for as little as $2 per month. Thank you again, and on to the video. There's a great deal of mythology surrounding the founders of the United States of America. Conservatives and liberals alike love to appeal to the Founding Fathers as these great authority figures, whom with respect to political policy or agenda that they argue for, would certainly agree with them and be on their side of whatever issue that they're repping for, effectively arguing the case that their political agenda is the most constitutionally sound and in line with this ideal that ought to be. On one hand, liberals will invoke the Founders as these great men of noble progressive ideals, effectively appealing to the more progressive elements of America's national tradition as to argue for left-wing reform. The genius of the Constitution is that it can always be changed. The genius of the Constitution is that it makes no permanent rule other than its faith in the wisdom of ordinary people to govern themselves. On the other hand, American conservatives will do the exact same thing, except they'll point to the more overtly reactionary components of the Founders as to justify preserving the status quo, that is, when they're not also trying to argue for the metaphorical rolling back of the clocks to an earlier period of time when things were supposedly better. See that flag? I would die for that flag. The Constitution that you are supposed to uphold? I would die for that! Today, I come to you as an enlightened centrist. Nope, not that kind of centrist. Yeah, that kind. To tell you that the liberals and the conservatives have it all wrong. Today, I'm here to explain the true nature of the Founding Fathers as well as the establishment of this country, what they really meant when they spoke of freedom, liberty, and democracy, to whom that freedom and liberty was actually intended for, why the Founding Fathers actually suck and were shitty revolutionaries, how striving for the ideals of the Founders in this day and age means setting the bar incredibly low, and why we as a society should strive to go well above and beyond the original ideals of the United States entirely. Back in the 1700s, during the foundational years of this country, the white settler population of the early United States primarily constituted small farmers, landed tenants, proletarians, and indentured servants, the latter of whom were functionally slaves with term limits. Property qualifications barred the vast majority of the white population from voting or running for office, and even when said qualifications were lifted, Many simply did not have the money or the resources needed to commit to politics since the working population were burdened with rents, high taxes, bonded servitude, and private debts. Even with the lifting of property restrictions after the Revolutionary War, due to the common man's economic destitution and general precarity, due to the disenfranchisement of women, blacks, and indigenous people, politics was still then, and still is to this day, by and large, a rich man's game. And thus, with no representation coming from the masses below, the founders of this country exclusively constituted wealthy white slave owners, plantation owners, merchants, barons, bankers, and manufacturers, most, if not all of whom, had inherited their wealth and privilege. Among these wealthy propertied white men include the likes of figures we all know and love, such as Washington, Madison, and Jefferson. And with all the levers of power in the hands of these wealthy, white, property-owning men, they would set about constructing a nation that was a rich man's paradise. Numerous legal anti-democratic fail-safes were built into the political apparatus with this goal in mind, including, but not limited to, the Supreme Court, or a council of nine unelected, unaccountable judges which have the power to kill any legislation in the water deemed unconstitutional. The Electoral College or a system of delegates designed to slant the presidential election results in the favor of the more reactionary candidate every single time. Filibustering, or the deliberate stalling and prolonging of a debate done by a minority of senators in Congress in an attempt to stop the passage of a bill. Voter suppression, or the deliberate curbing of the number of people allowed to participate in the election on completely arbitrary grounds. Lobbying, or the inherently insular pay-to-play nature of political participation and campaign finance, which has always been an omnipresent facet in this country as evidenced by the fact that the founders themselves were all wealthy, white, property-owning men. We will review these legal, democracy-terminating levers in detail in a future video. 
For now, all you need to know is that the founders put these levers in place as to design a political system that deliberately doesn't work, the reasoning of which will be explored here in a moment. In Madison's Federalist Papers 10, he writes in detail about the need to suppress the democratic will of the majority. Quote, The latent causes of faction are thus sown in the nature of man, and we see them everywhere brought into the different degrees of activity, according to the different circumstances of civil society. But the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. Those who are creditors and those who are debtors. A landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a mercantile interest, a moneyed interest, with the many lesser interests, grow up of necessity in civilized nations, and divide them into different classes, actuated by different sentiments and views. When a majority is included in a faction, the form of popular government, on the other hand, enables it to sacrifice its ruling passion or interest both the public good and the rights of other citizens, to secure the public good and private rights against the danger of such a faction, and at the same time to preserve the spirit and form of popular government, is then the great object to which our inquiries are directed. By what means is this object attainable? Either the existence of the same passion or interest in a majority at the exact time must be prevented, or the majority, having such coexistent passions or interest, must be rendered, by their numbers and local situation, unable to concert and carry into effect schemes of oppression. If the impulse and the opportunity be suffered to coincide, we well know that neither moral nor religious motives can be relied on as an adequate control. From this view of the subject, it may be concluded that a pure democracy can admit of no cure for this mischiefs of faction. Hence, it is that such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with the personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Theoretic politicians, who have patronized this species of government, have erroneously supposed that by reducing mankind to a perfect equally in their political rights, they would, at the same time, be perfectly equalized and assimilated in their possessions, their opinions, and their passions. A republic, by which I mean a government in which the scheme of representation takes place, opens a different prospect and promises the cure for which we are seeking." Unquote. Next up, here's what Jefferson had to say about democracy in his first inaugural address. Quote, All too will bear in mind this sacred principle, that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will, to be rightful, must be reasonable, that the minority possesses their equal rights, which equal laws must protect, and to violate would be oppression. Unquote. Questions. Who do you think that it is Jefferson and Madison and the rest of the founders were referring to when they spoke of the need to curtail the will of the majority? What is it you think that they actually meant by preventing oppression by protecting the rights of the minority? Who is this minority that they speak so fondly of and seek to bend over backwards accommodating the rights of? Were they the Mexicans and the Indians whom they slaughtered and chased off their land? Were they the African slaves whom were being imported across the Atlantic Ocean to do forced labor on their private plots? Of course not. The minority which the founders were referring to were the wealthy, white, property-owning men to which they themselves were a part of, and the freedom which they sought to secure was the freedom to invest, the freedom of property, the freedom to enslave and genocide and exploit those beneath them the freedom to enrich themselves off of the hard work of others, and the so-called tyranny of the majority that they speak of is in reference to the masses below, whom would encroach on their freedom to own, exploit, and accumulate. They're the minority that needs protection from the majority, intruding on their property rights. In other words, the civil rights and the economic rights, the human rights of the poor working majority come to an end where the property and conquest rights of the affluent minority begin. So what the founders really meant by a free society was a rich man's playground, where they had the freedom to exploit, to steal, to rob, and to enslave those beneath them. In other words, a free society where they were free to restrict the freedom of others. 
In wake of this well-documented and plainly obvious historical fact, liberals will try and belabor the case that the founders were a product of the time, and despite their flaws, they were genuine and authentic in their pursuits to build a free country. And that can be true. From manifest destiny, to taxation without representation, to a secular government of elected representatives within a constitutional republic for the people and by the people, it can be true that the founders were completely sincere in their efforts and intentions, while it can also be true at the same time that they were trying to do so within the context of their own class interests. Unfortunately, due to the inherently contradictory nature of trying to realize a free and just society while simultaneously trying to maintain a class system by which its very nature works in the direct reverse opposite of that goal, the resulting cognitive dissonance in the wake of this becomes incredibly laid bare and obvious, especially when one looks back to the likes of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Back in their day, Jefferson and Washington wrote scathing condemnations of the institution of slavery, while at the same time, were slave-owning men themselves, owning hundreds of pieces of human property whom conducted forced labor on their gigantic private plantations. And when one factors for the real motivations behind the Revolutionary War, the settlers and the founders' class interest becomes even more laid bare. Quote, the European settlers in the USA had been involved in the slaughtering of Indians at least since their invasion of Roanoke in 1607 and Plymouth in 1620. Although Britain advised the settlers to pay for the land they seized, such a requirement was virtually impossible to enforce, especially since the colony states had been made fairly autonomous, even when local British military forces formally forbade settlers from invading Indian territories, enforcement was very difficult without more troops and more formal British laws. As a result, until 1763, the settlers were able to freely steal from the Indians and kill any of them who got in their way, and even in instances of actual settlers' purchase of land from the Native Americans, fraud was normally involved. Within such an environment, fighting naturally broke out frequently. In an attempt to help protect both themselves and their land from the invading American settlers, many Indians allied themselves with the French in various wars, as well as politically with Britain in some of the continuous disputes over settlers stealing their Indian property. While frontiersmen like George Washington saw the proclamation as a temporary expedient to quiet the minds of the Indians, and while there were numerous attempted breaches of this law, including an outright military invasion of Indian territory by Virginia militia in 1774, the Indians, with some British encouragement in the complex political environment, had some success in enforcing the proclamation. In fact, the 1763 legal infringement on settlers' right to steal Indian land was one of the primary motivating factors in the American Settlers' Revolution from British rule 12 years later although important tax and trade issues were also involved in the conflict. Most Indians quite naturally sided with the British against the USA in the Revolutionary American War, which lasted until at least 1782 west of the Allegheny Mountains. Despite some French political assistance later in the war, USA attempts to win Indian neutrality with treaties promising to steal no more Indian land and to engage in friendly trade, though which the Indians hoped to obtain the weapons needed to defend against their settler encroachments on their land, were foiled by continued USA settler invasion of Indian territories and by the USA's failure to pay for goods traded with the Indians. After the United States victory over Britain, the white settlers were freed from British legislation prohibiting the theft of more land from the Native Americans. As a result, it became possible for more USA territories and states to be created out of further areas stolen from the Indians. The USA initially claimed all Indian territory as its own, arrogantly announcing that the Indians as a whole had no right whatsoever to their own land, and offered the Indian nations the choice of various small reservations under USA domination or the destruction of their women and children, unquote. Murphy, Triumph of Evil, page 32-33. And so there you have it. The real motivation behind the Revolutionary War was because, under British law, the colonists were forbidden from engaging in outright wanton genocide and land theft of the natives, and were obligated to respect their property rights. As you can see, the founders didn't like that, 
nor did they like the fact that Britain, in the following years, had outlawed the institution of slavery as well. Furthermore, many Africans and indigenous people joined up in arms with the Redcoats against the Yankees during the Revolutionary War for the simple reason that the British weren't out to genocide and enslave them like the Americans were. So in the centuries that followed, it should be no surprise that America ended up stealing 80% of its new land from the natives, and it ended up taking widespread slave revolts everywhere out in the Caribbean, and a fucking civil war in order to bring an end to slavery. And of course the country is founded on the double standard. That's our history. We were founded on a very basic double standard. This country was founded by slave owners who wanted to be free. So they killed a lot of white English people in order to continue owning their black African people so they could wipe out the rest of the red Indian people and move west and steal the rest of the land from the brown Mexican people, giving them a place to take off and drop their nuclear weapons on the yellow Japanese people. You know what the motto of this country ought to be? You give us a color, we'll wipe it out. Just so you know, viewer, history did not have to pan out the way that it did. During the foundational years of this country, the Founders never had to maintain the institution of slavery. They never had to wipe out and steal all of the land from the Native Americans. They could have abolished slavery on the spot and enshrined the right to self-determination directly into the Constitution, and instead chose to coexist with the Natives from the start. Instead of just saying that they stood for freedom and liberty, they could have actually went about implementing the socioeconomic reform, which would have actually realized the outcome leading to the most freedom and liberty for all, rather than a tiny minority of wealthy oligarchs at the expense of literally everybody else. They could have brought about land reform, the abolition of rent-seeking, and the implementation of an economic bill of rights granting people legal equality as well as economic equality. They could have actually stood for something and put the classical liberal principles into practice as prescribed by the likes of Adam Smith and John Locke. But they didn't. They just couldn't help themselves stealing all that land, hoarding all that wealth, and enslaving all those people, apparently. So with that being said, stop giving credit to these people for your rights, and instead start giving credit to these people, because they're the ones who actually fought for them and took a principled stance when no one else would. The people that you have to thank for your freedoms which you enjoy today are the people comprising the revolutionary tradition of this country, standing in solidarity with the masses against and in direct opposition to the United States government and ruling class, whom have been on the opposite side of virtually every single struggle for equality, democracy, and social progress since the dawn of class society. The Constitution was a concession which the Founders reluctantly gave onto us out of fear of democracy, not because of democracy, since at the time of its drafting, uprisings such as Shays Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion were commonplace. The regular working people of the time were destitute and couldn't keep up with the high rents, debts, and taxes, so they formed militias and took up arms against the government in response. In this regard, it should be no wonder, then, why the first ten amendments of the Constitution just so happen to pertain to the interests and needs of this group, from freedom of the press to the right to assemble and form militias, to the increased degree of decentral political autonomy granted to the states, to the huge gains made in the expansion of legal rights granted to individual citizens under court of law, i.e. the right to a lawyer, the right to a speedy and fair trial, and protection against property seizures, excessive fines, and cruel and unusual punishments. One can definitely see how such legal gains would be substantially beneficial to a population of debtor farmers and poor white settlers at a time when America was basically semi-feudal. At a time when after the Revolutionary War, where economic turmoil, depression, bankruptcy, unemployment, high taxes, unpayable debt burdens, enclosures, and land seizures by finance schools were widespread. And though the first ten amendments did virtually nothing to address the working population's needs from an economic standpoint, though the U.S. Constitution was and still is to this day woefully substandard and completely overshadowed by superior constitutions drafted by civilized societies on the other side of the globe, it did provide a baseline of much-needed legal equality as to provide a narrow out for just enough people to bootstrap their way out of poverty, and it also served to validate the freedom and liberty narrative that that people in this country love to full so much. 
Shit-talking aside, the Constitution was indeed an important historic document, as it laid the necessary legal groundwork needed to allow for the formation of capitalist economic relations. Needless to say, the Founding Fathers, for all their hubris and their cognitive dissonance, were not stupid. They were more than well aware of what happens when concessions aren't granted to the masses during periods of heightened class antagonism. And had they not done something to blunt the edges of the system, that they themselves would be at risk of being overthrown for the exact same reasons that the French monarchy was overthrown during the First French Revolution. Otherwise, the Constitution, along with a myriad of concessions and reforms kicked down to us in the decades and centuries that followed, along with the bribery and propping up of the white middle class via the spoils of genocidal and imperialist plunder done both domestically and abroad, include, but are not limited to, the abolition of debtor prisons, the abolition of slavery, antitrust laws, New Deal legislation, the Civil Rights Act, the end of Jim Crow, the Great Society legislation, the expansion of the right to vote, pro-worker and consumer government agencies such as the EPA, OSHA, CPB, CDC, Roe v. Wade, Brown v. Board, unionization, etc. And contrary to the whitewashing that transpires in our history books, these reforms were not given to us by the politicians or the ruling class willingly of their own altruistic volition. All of these reforms, including the ratification of the Constitution itself, were done so incredibly reluctantly out of an understanding by the most sensible members of the ruling class that if a compromise with labor was not reached, if concessions were not granted to pacify the masses, that the masses would turn to socialist revolution instead. That's all the abolition of slavery was, that's all the New Deal was, that's all the Constitution was, and that's all the civil rights was, and that's all it can ever be. A bribe. Scraps. Scraps which they periodically tossed down to us to peel away the moderates and pragmatic centrists from the movement, while the police and the deep state at large come along to clean up, beat up, jail, and execute the radicals left over. And then in the decades which follow, they whitewash the history books, give all the credit to the US government for the gains made by the people fighting against and working in direct opposition of the United States government, and then tokenize and sanitize the radicals at the helm, defanging their message and transmuting them and their movements behind them into harmless symbols which pose no real threat to power, and keep people working within the confines of an insular two-party duopoly designed to frustrate, to Moralize, sandbag, fearmonger, manipulate, gaslight, mislead, lie to, and recuperate any and all efforts for meaningful social change. And it is until the United States proletariat is able to wake up and break free from the American fever dream, recognize their collective class interest, organize on their own terms, and make the conscious, deliberate decision to fight for socialism that they will only continue to blindly perpetrate the institutions and mechanisms of their own oppression. 